There are very few places in the world with such immense, untouched, unspoiled natural beauty, stretching from the Atlantic provinces in the east to the great Pacific west coast. Canada is one of the largest and most naturally preserved countries, with over 40 national parks committed to the preservation of its beautiful national resources, unique wildlife species, and diverse cultures. As we celebrate Canada's 150th anniversary, we invite everyone to come and experience our national parks and these vast nature preserves in the celebration of the Confederation of Canada. Are you ready for Canada's 150th birthday? Est-ce que vous êtes prêts pour le 150e de la Confédération? Hey, oui! Let's come together and celebrate Canada. So what does Canada mean to you? Well, Canada is kind and it's welcoming. And not only are we culturally diverse, but we're also diverse in our landscapes and of course our seasons uh, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Arctic. It's such a great and varied landscape to, to visit and to explore. When you think about just, you know, uh, over the years, uh, the way that, you know, Canada's always been a very multicultural country, but the way that we've kind of evolved by accepting more people from more different backgrounds and more different places, you know, just, you know, the indigenous people that we have living in Canada and all the traditions that they share and sort of more of the, the cultures that they share being coming more and more prominent here in Jasper National Park, um, both those kinds of things together, you know, just really, to me, that's what makes Canada really special. Canada welcomes all nationalities to experience our great natural parks. Our provinces and territories offer something special to all visitors. From skiing in British Columbia, hot springs in Banff and Jasper, to fishing in the Great North and wildlife preserves in Sable Island on the Atlantic coast. The variety of scenic beauty here in Alberta offers visitors with breathtaking experiences linked with history. So, Brian, what can you tell us about the history here in Jasper National Park? Well, the history in Jasper National Park is a pretty big topic because it literally goes back thousands of years with the indigenous people. But the modern history of Jasper National Park really began back in the winter of 1810, 1811, when David Thompson came through on his epic journey over Athabasca Pass to reconnect with his trade routes that he had established on the other side of the divide. And once he put this place on the map, once people became aware of it, then more and more people became interested in it. Of course, immediately following David Thompson's passage through the area, the fur trade, the fur trade company, the Northwest Company, who he was working for, decided that this is going to be a good place for a depot. Not necessarily a trading post, although trading did go on at Jasper House. Jasper House, the depot they set up, was more of a provisional depot, a place where the voyageur brigades could take on supplies. They could get uh, teams of dogs for their dog sleds to cross the pass, or if it was more in the summertime, then horses were kept there as well. So it was a provisional depot to outfit the people who were crossing Athabasca Pass and later on Yellowhead Pass as well. Established in 1885, the national parks began as protected areas to preserve Canada's natural heritage rich in beauty with immense northern landscapes and boreal forests to temperate rainforests and prairie grasslands. In 1907, Jasper was established by then former Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier. Later in 1930, Canada passed the National Parks Act and the area known as Jasper Forest Park officially became Jasper National Park. So when the railway started to come through here and finally completed their line into the valley here in 1911, Ironically, they gave the place the name Fitzhugh, but eventually uh, Fitzhugh name was dropped and we adopted the name Jasper to represent the, the region, to represent the national park, and finally the town site too. Jasper National Park attracts some 4 million visitors each year due to its uniquely shaped valleys, mountain peaks, where it supports flourishing bends of alpine meadows, subalpine forests, and montane ecovegetation. When people think about Jasper, there's a few things that pop to their mind. They think, of course, of the beautiful mountain landscape. They think of the glaciers, and they think of the wildlife. 
Some people have likened uh, Jasper National Park as sort of like a, a Serengeti of the Canadian Rockies with so much wildlife roaming around and so easy to see. Like where else can you go and walk down a sidewalk in town and have to pass by an elk okay? or maybe some mule deer. So wildlife here is um, both abundant and quite visible. And now when I say it, it's visible, there are certain species that you're more likely to encounter, species that don't mind hanging out close to us. Jasper is, is well known for its wildlife. You see the, the herds of elk uh, roaming around the valley bottom. Uh, you see mule deer and white-tailed deer. If you get up to higher elevations, then you start to see moose or even caribou if you're really lucky. One of the, the parts of human history that I really like about Jasper is a part that you don't hear too much about. It's the part that stretches back thousands and thousands of years, basically right to the point where the glaciers were receding up these valleys and people were on those glaciers coattails. Okay? As soon as there were some plants for them to use, as soon as there were some animals for them to hunt, they were here. And archaeological evidence in the park has shown us that people were here 5,200 years ago and using this area as a base. So I, I kind of love that part of it. And also knowing that it wasn't just people who were here. It was that people were coming from different directions and passing through as well. They were using this area for travel and trade. Some of the archaeological evidence that we found here in Jasper National Park includes volcanic rock or obsidian. And if you're familiar with your national park geology here, you know that all of the mountains that we have around here are sedimentary in origin. There's very little or, uh, igneous or volcanic rock. So where did this rock come from? Well, it turns out the geologists can actually trace that rock back to its point of origin. And the volcanic glass that they found here came from Mount Edziza, which is a big volcano out in the coastal mountain ranges, sort of north of Terish, British Columbia. So somebody went over there, collected that rock, collected that volcanic glass, and it ended up here being used as microblades to help butcher food. Also, sometimes you get really lucky and somebody will be up hiking on a mountainside and all of a sudden, oh, what's that? Okay. And then they reach down, they pick it up, and it's a spear point that they have found. A spear point that some of the, these things we sent off for analysis are 8,000 years old and there they are lying on the surface. So sometimes you get really lucky with stuff like that. And of course, if people are hearing this and they think, oh, I'm gonna go out and find some of that, okay, we'd absolutely love to find out. We prefer if you didn't move it, we prefer if you had a GPS, you marked its location, and then let us know about it. Take some photos and stuff like that, in case there's some other archeological evidence in that area. And of course, being it's a national park, being it is a cultural resource, you're, you're not gonna be allowed to keep that item. But you can definitely contribute to our understanding of the indigenous history in this area by reporting finds like that and letting us know what's out there. The Columbia Icefield Parkway, just an hour outside of town, provides direct access to some of the most exceptional scenery found anywhere in the world. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada designated Jasper National Park part of a collective UNESCO World Heritage Site. This dark sky preserve makes it the largest such reserve in the world, establishing a commitment to protect and conserve the night sky by trying to eliminate light pollution. We caught up with Parks Canada about the unique opportunity about Canada's parks being free in 2017. Well, it basically comes down to Canada's 150th birthday, and national parks are such an important part of the Canadian fabric. I think we all are very proud when we see those pictures of Banff and Jasper and, you know, the places out east like Fundy and all the beautiful places that are our national parks, and they're part of our foundation as a, as a nation, something that we've sort of kept separate and... Uh, people can still go and get reunited with nature and connect to nature and do all that stuff. So when you're celebrating the 150th birthday, national parks are kind of like Parliament Hill. It's kind of like that little center part that brings everybody together and, and uh, the government in its budget back in, in, in February said, 
we're going to let everybody come in free, experience it, celebrate national parks, celebrate the, the greatest nation in the world on its 150th birthday, and make it like a, a national celebration. And it's a really good time to not just come to parks like Jasper and Banff that get all the headlines, but all those national historic sites and some of the lesser known parks that we have some of those here in Alberta. It's a good chance you get in free. You can go out there and you can, Fort St. James over in BC, it's about a four hour drive from here, is this wonderful take back fort that you can recapture the history and you can actually stay there overnight in the middle of, a, of, of an old fort. So experiences like that are available to Canadians and sometimes we forget about them. So let's do it in the 150th birthday. In 1913, Elk Island National Park was developed as a sanctuary of diverse woodlands and meadows with lakes, bogs, and ponds. The park is Canada's eighth smallest in area size, but largest fully enclosed national park. So Elk Island started in 1906. There were five gentlemen from Fort Saskatchewan uh, who noticed that the elk herds were dwindling in the area and they wanted to do something about it. So they went to the Canadian government and made out a deal and uh, Elk Park was, was created in 1906. But the year following, in 1907, uh, we got into uh, bison conservation. Bison nearly went extinct in the 1800s. We went from having 30 million bison to less than a thousand individuals in a single human lifetime. As a result of the fence, rigorous resource management techniques have been used to preserve and improve the park's ecological integrity and biodiversity. So Elk Island National Park is one of the, the smaller national parks in Canada. It's uh, 194 square kilometers. Elk Island is also the only completely fenced national park in Canada. One of the reasons that the, the bison from Elk Island National Park are in such high demand, both throughout Canada and, and internationally for conservation efforts, is that they are considered disease-free, uh, cattle gene free and they're considered to have high genetic diversity and the fence is one of the key things that allows us to do this. One of the last largest herds ended up being taken from Montana and sent to the newly created Elk Island Park. So we've been protecting bison for more than a century. So not many people realize that Elk Island is the center of bison conservation in Canada. Most of the bison in Canada come from here. We've been protecting them for more than a hundred years and we have both subspecies of bison. We have the plains bison and the wood bison, which is the largest land mammal in North America. In our province's historic past, the Aboriginal Cree inhabited the park region, trading beaver pelts and harvesting elk, bison, moose, and smaller animals and bringing them to the market in Fort Edmonton. The beaver is a really interesting story and it really connects Elk Island with Edmonton. This area is called the Beaver Hills, filled with wetlands, and uh, the beaver were ripe in this area. There were tons of them. It was a very, very important area to the fur trade. So there's a little fur trading post that started up that you guys might recognize that has been turned into Edmonton. So Edmonton started off as a fur trading post for the beavers in the Beaver Hills. The beaver ended up being extirpated or completely wiped out from this area and Elk Island in the 1900s, uh, we introduced them. While there were tons of beaver before the fur trade, uh, no beaver in this area after the fur trade, there are now tons of beaver uh, to see again in Elk Island National Park because of our conservation efforts. Elk Island can serve so many kinds of animals. For example, we have elk, moose, deer, beavers, we're part of the, the North American Flyway, a major migratory route for birds, goes across Elk Island. So more than 250 species of birds make their home at Elk Island throughout the year, and it's a very important nesting area. Due to its tiny size, most large predators, apart from the coyote, have disappeared. This has allowed the plains bison to be reintroduced to protected areas scattered throughout their historic area. 2017 is Canada's 150th birthday. Elk Island is the perfect place for international visitors to come to. A lot of people are interested in the iconic Canadian experiences and we help you do all of those here. Um, snowshoeing, camping, canoeing, we'll help you do all of that. And Parks Canada places are the perfect place to come and celebrate. People can get really excited about the camping opportunities out here. The same way that Elk Island is a refuge for things from bison to beaver to birds, it's also a refuge for people to escape the, the hustle and bustle of the city. People can come out here and either picnic for the day or they can camp overnight. We're really pleased to offer something new this year called Authentics. 
So an authentic is a cross between a tent and a log cabin. And so it's a really good blend of comfort and adventure. And you can book it with up to six friends, so it accommodates six people. And if you're interested in camping at Elk Island or any national park, go on the website and book as soon as possible, because it's the Canada's 150th birthday and things are going to fill up quick. In February, February 20th, we're going to have Family Day. On July 1st, we're going to have Canada Day, which is going to be wonderful. Mid-July, we're going to have Parks Day. Mid-August, we're going to have our Bison Festival, celebrating everything to do with Bison. And on September Long Weekend, we're going to be having our Star Party. Elk Island has been part of the Beaver Hills Dark Sky Preserve for just over 10 years now. So basically, it's a place that conserves the stars. We have, there's a lot of light pollution in the cities and out here Elk Island is also the perfect place to see the northern lights as they were meant to be seen. And additionally, uh, just recently the Elk Island's now been part of the, the new UNESCO designation where part of the Beaver Hills Biosphere Reserve. Our biggest lake is Astoton Lake in the north end of the park. This is where most of the festivities are. There are tons of little lakes and little ponds throughout the park. 12,000 years ago, this area was covered by a glacier and the receding glacier kind of scraped across the land, tore up little holes and melted in the pockets. And so you have tons of wetlands throughout Elk Island. So people can find out more about Elk Island by going onto our website, by finding us on Twitter. Parks Canada has a new Instagram account, you might see a, a little bit of Elk Island on there. And of course by calling our visitor centre. Parks Canada is responsible for fulfilling Canada's obligations under the World Heritage Convention of the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO. Their mandate is to protect and present nationally significant examples of Canada's natural and cultural heritage. With hope to educate public understanding and appreciation in the ways that guarantee Canada's ecological and commemorative integrity for present and future generations to come.
this is.